say good morning to our wonderful family up at St. Peter's. It's good to see you guys today. Excited about what God is going to do there and say there at St. Peter's this morning as well. And all of you on the internet watching, our missionaries, shout out to all of you around the world. All right. Um, I want to deal with this subject this morning. Improve your words and you can improve your life. I want to ask you another trivia question, one that I got wrong when someone asked me the question, so it might be a trick question. What is the first thing that God created? Now, think about that. What is the first thing that God created? When someone asked me, I said light. How many of you know that would be a really good answer? Let there be light was the first thing he said on the first day. But the person asking me this was a Jewish person, and they said, no, there's something God created before that, and you can't even see it unless you understand Hebrew. He said, because in the English translation of the Bible, it's translated as the word the. So I want, you to, I want to read you that verse in the English Bible, then I'll read it to you how it actually reads in Hebrew. In the beginning, this is Genesis 1, verse 1, the very first verse in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the, there it is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then, how many of you notice that word then? Then God said, all right? Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, in my recollection of reading the English version of the Bible, I just thought that, you know, God created the heavens and the earth by starting it by creating light. Now, Here's another verse that really goes with that. John 1 and, and verse 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we all know that God created the heavens with what? With words. But how did he get the words? Where did they come from? You don't really understand this till you look at the Hebrew Bible and how it's written. So I want to show you in Hebrew, you may not be able to read it, but you can see the, the portion that I've underlined. In the portion that I've underlined, it says, this is the line, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the way it's translated in our English Bible. This is the original form of the Bible, the original Hebrew. You see what I've underlined there? That's the portion of your Bible and my Bible that says the, but it's not the word the at all. It's a word that you cannot translate properly and make a sentence, so they made an English sentence out of it by putting, inserting the word the. As a matter of fact, this is completely left out of our Bible. It says in the beginning, reading from this way to this, this side to this side, in the beginning God created a left and tav which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It's like saying, in the beginning, God created the alphabet, and then he used the alphabet to form words. In the beginning, God created A through Z, and then he turned A through Z into words, and after he created words, then he said with those words, let there be light. So the first thing you have to understand is where did God get the words to actually say, let there be light? Was there a language before that time? So in the beginning, God created the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In the beginning, God created the Aleph through the Tav, and then he used the Hebrew alphabet to form words to create the world with. Now, why do you think that is important? Because you and I need to understand that in the beginning, you create your words. And then you use your words to create your world. You choose or someone chose for you what words you would choose to build a marriage on. What words you would choose to, to define yourself as a Christian. What words that you would choose to build a, 
a, a business on. A business is built on a mission statement. It's words that form the preferred future of that business. It's a vision statement. That's what vision casting is. It's taking words and saying, if I say these words often enough, we will begin to act them out and that will become our preferred future. I am literally using words to create the future that I want to create in my life. So by choosing words first and by eliminating certain words and by adding certain words, we can begin our year or begin our life by choosing words that we want to create a better life for us. For instance, say, I will never say certain words because they will bring a negative connotation on my marriage. So I choose to never say certain words when I'm speaking to my spouse. I choose never to say certain words when I'm speaking to my children because I'm trying to construct them. I'm trying to create them. I choose never to use certain words when I'm trying to form a child into an adult. I choose never to use certain words when I'm speaking about God or I'm speaking about my church. So keep this in mind. Point one is that your words have a creative power. And the first thing God did was create letters. And from those letters, he formed words. And from those words, he created everything he needed to create. You and I are doing the very same thing. Our words are more important than we realize. We are either speaking life or death into every relationship in our life. We're either speaking life or death into our marriages. We're either speaking life or death into, our, into our, the places where we work. We're either speaking life or death into our friendships. We're either speaking life or death into our relationships with our family and our friends and everyone around us. You're either speaking life or death. There are no other choices. Every word counts. Why? Well, God not only started creating by creating words. Secondly, words uh, are seeds. And whether we realize it or not, your words never die. I don't like the fact that they never die, but I didn't decide that. You know, I've actually heard that science can prove that every word that's ever been spoken is still floating around out there. How many of you are scared right now? I know I am. Every word you've ever spoken is actually floating around out there in the airwaves somehow. They have not found a way to collect them, and I hope they don't. But they have not found a way to collect them. But they say that every word that's ever been spoken, every sound wave still exists somewhere. That those words never die. Well, here's the thing that you and I need to know. That words are seeds. They don't just end the things you say to someone are don't just end. Even if they forgive you, even if they forget about them, it still might recreate them in some way. It might fashion the way they dress, fashion the way they look, fashion the way they speak. It might still uh, cause them to become a different person just because this is in their head somewhere. So keep in mind that every word that we speak is a seed. Let me prove that to you. I want to go to Proverbs 18, and all of this is on the screen since I didn't ask you to look this one up. It, it's on the screen. I want you to see this. First of all, it starts off with a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. How many of you know that people get offended with our words, right? That's how they get offended. So a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. So if someone is contending with me, if we're in an argument, I've got them walled out. How many of you know that if you're in an argument with somebody, you have, them, you have a wall up? You don't let them in, but only so far in an argument. You don't listen to everything they say. So that's why when people argue, they have to use a lot of words because they don't know which one's going to get through the going to get through the bars or not because everybody keeps each other at length, at arm's length a man's stomach shall be filled from the fruit of his mouth he's not talking about food here from the produce of his lips he shall be filled now no, notice this death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit now Understand this analogy. It's a produce analogy. 
So God is saying that your words, every word that you speak produces fruit. Every word that you speak is like a seed that goes into somebody's life and it either produces good fruit or bad fruit. And we'll read another scripture later on in the sermon that talks about when a tree is producing bad fruit, what you should do to it. And what a, if a tree is producing good fruit, how wonderful that is. But keep in mind that words are seeds. We really need to stop and think. But here's the problem. We can't really control, most people can't really control what they say. So changing your words doesn't happen through changing your words. Changing your words happens through changing your heart. And when you change your heart, your words automatically line up and change with your heart. Look at this. He says that the, our belly is being satisfied. The fruit of our lips is producing something that is internal. It is satisfying the soul of man, the stomach area, the, the, the part of us, the guts inside of us. It's satisfying that. So I would say that the first thing we need to do, knowing that all of our words are seeds, we probably need to pray David's prayer, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. How many of you know that's a good prayer, especially for the person you're married to? Yeah, uh, I know Faith should be raising her hand right now because she knows that that is a prayer I need to pray because I can be a little impulsive sometimes with the things I say. And that, I mean, you know, I, I have to apologize all the time. I'm not too big for that. You know, I'm, I'm not too, I'm not, I don't have so much pride in my life that I can't just say, man, I wish I'd have said that differently. You know, it, you know my heart, you know what I mean, but I wish I had just said that a little different way. So keep in mind that our words are like seeds. But here's a prayer that, that we should all be praying over our words. It's in Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth, some of you can quote this. If you can, quote it with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, that is praying over your, over your words, saying, Lord, let me say the right words. Let me use the right words when I speak. Let the words of my mouth, but not only that, let the meditations of my heart, because I realize that it's my heart that's dictating what's coming out of my mouth. It's how I really feel about things on the inside that's causing me to say the things that are coming out of my mouth. So change my heart and change my words so I don't have a need to say all the wrong things in my life. But you know, I think that we should go a step further. I think that we should pray over our words, but I think that, you know, last week I talked about putting uh, statements on your mirror to start your day with and claim those statements over your day. Several people, um, you know, text me and some sent emails and some on Facebook and Twitter and said, Pastor, I've already got my list on the, on the mirror. And I hope that all of you did that because it's an amazing tool to speak life over yourself with every single day. But I think that maybe we should put another list out beside that list. And this is what this list looks like. These are the words I'm going to discipline myself to stop saying. Now, some of them you may need to say every now and then, but stop using them casually in my conversation. So I, I put these in your, um, in your uh, bulletin uh, outline, so you can take a look at those in, in, in your outline, and all of those are there. But here are some words that I think that we should stop using. First of all, the word hey. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I just hate this. I just hate that. I just hate my, or how about the word death? I just love it to death. I just hate it to death. You know, everything is death. It's like everything they say has the word death in the phrase somewhere. It's like, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to date the death angel. My goodness, you know? you know, that's one word I think I can remove unless someone dies. I can say it, but I don't want to love anything to death and everything to death. And, 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 and so when people say hate, Hate is not just a phrase they use for people. It's a, I hate my job. I hate my, I hate my house. I hate my clothes. I hate my hair. I hate my stomach. You know, I hate my, I hate my ankles. I hate this. And before you know it, their whole life is filled with hate all around them. I think that's a word we can probably get rid of. You know, and just use, uh, you know, when you say God hates these six things and the seventh one he abhors. You can use that phrase when you're quoting the scripture. But Words like pity, words like swear words. You know, I think we should all just work hard to eliminate swear words, whether we think uh, they're wrong or not. 
I think that it's just too risky. It's just be better to give up all your country words. I know God's convicted me for all of mine but one, and last year he convicted me of that one. I had one left, and now I can't even go back to the country. I don't know how to talk anymore. <laughs> so I just have to, uh, it's like I'm going to have to take somebody with me and say, tell them what I mean. They'll never understand me any, anymore. I've given up all of it. But, but the truth is there are some words we just need to give up in our life. I'm trying to make you laugh, but you get the point, right? How about words like stupid? How many really think there's a real cause to use the word stupid all the time? Have you ever met anybody uses it every day, every hour? <laughs> I think we can give up that word. It's not constructive. It's not helping us. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, death, hell, never, nothing. I mean, just negative words that create a negative environment around us. How about words that we should start using? Words like love, words like please and thank you. How many of you know at least one person who just missed out on the day that parents taught their kids to say please and thank you? They just missed that day somehow. I mean, what kind of kid does it say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and please and thank you? I mean, isn't that like basic? Isn't that like... You know, don't be a rude child. Learn that by the time you're two. How many of you agree with that? And that's not old school. Get that out of your crawl. That's just being polite. That's just being, that's just being a nice person. Has nothing to do about how we did it. I mean, that's something we should be doing. Please and thank you. I mean, what kind of man can't say I love you? I don't even want to know that guy. That's not a man. That's a wimp. Okay, maybe I should get wimp out of my vocabulary. But you get the point. I mean, we ought to be able to say, I love you. That's not, so, that's not showing weakness or vulnerability. That's showing what? Love. God is, yeah, love. So if God can do it, I think we can do it too. I had a member of my family for a long time never could say love. And they'd say, that's how they said I love you. I'd say, man, I love you. And they'd say, Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> Where did they get that? And that's how they said it every time. I mean, it was just, it was a joke because I just knew they were going to do it. So I'd say, watch this. You know, hey, man, I love you. Appreciate you, brother. It's how they did it. Say love. Uh, say words like awesome, fantastic, tremendous. Yeah. Say words like good. Say words like I'm excited. Use words like anticipating. Use words like hope. Use words like praise. I mean, those are passionate, great words that create life all around you. If you keep saying all that, man, that's good. Man, that's good. I promise you're going to create good all around you. You keep saying that's tremendous. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's amazing. That's stupendous. There's your stupid. Use that version of it. I mean, use all these amazing words that create life around you. I promise you. It'll create better friendships, better relationships. It'll be a greater testimony. You'll preach better sermons. Everything is going to be better if you just choose good words. So how about some things that we should stop doing? If we want to put a guard over our mouth, we want to pray about that. How about complaining? How many of you know at least one person? It's okay to complain occasionally. But how many of you know a few people that really belong with the children of Israel in the wilderness? It's like, you know, if somebody's like, come on now. I'm afraid the earth is going to open up and swallow us in this room if I hang out here any longer. You know, so maybe we complain. How many of you know at least one person, and don't raise your hand if it's you, that complains too much? Think about it. Straight ahead. Nobody will ever know. Straight ahead. How about gossiping? I want to ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud. Do you gossip? Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Some of you have to say yes. That's the sad thing. Well, yeah, I do tell other people secrets. Yeah, I get a hold of something real juicy. I can't wait to get on my cell phone and get on speed dial and tell somebody. How about stop gossiping? How about repeating secrets? Raise your hand if someone's ever repeated your secret and it hurt you. Yeah, me too. Um, how about screaming? How many of you think marriages would just be better if everybody would start screaming? <laughs> Taught you, didn't I? <laughs> See, some people, they'll believe that. They believe that. They think that makes your marriage better. 
Who told you that? That's a childish behavior. You are acting like you're two when you do that. Go back to junior high. Learn the lesson again. It just don't work. How about degrading people? Have you ever met somebody that thinks they can criticize you into being a better person, but they can't take one ounce of criticism themselves? You ever met a person like that? So they can criticize, they tell everybody else how to do it, but they got such a big chip on their shoulder. You just turn that around them a little bit, and boy, they get so offended. <clears throat> this is a good sermon, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's not an easy one, but it's telling the truth. Amen. Thank you. Owe you a dollar. <laughs> Thought I'd get a few more after that. How about just making ugly faces to people? I heard Joel Osteen that he, he, he actually, I heard him say this in person. So I was at a conference and he was there speaking and he said that he actually listens to his sermons without uh, with the mute button on so he can't hear what he's saying, but he just watches his facial expression. First of all, I'm going to say he's got more time than I have. And secondly, <laughs> I probably need to do that every now and then because I'm sure he really doesn't have more time than me. But, but, but he cares so much about being a kind-hearted person that he watches himself because he doesn't want to say, God loves you. I mean, you know, that just don't come out the same way. You know, put that on YouTube and you'll ruin me. So watch it now. Uh, I mean, seriously, how many times... Do we think we said the right thing, but we just said it with the wrong facial expression? That's true. Uh, how about correcting your family in public? Somebody ought to jump up and shout right now. You've been waiting on me to say that forever. It's like, no, it's the truth. How many of you know that's degrading, that's embarrassing, and it makes you look... <laughs> Can't say it, can I? Makes you look like you need to hear this sermon. <laughs> so just don't do it. <laughs> okay, here's something you need to start doing, okay? Here's something you need to start doing. And this is all on the list in your outline. Praying, smiling, complimenting, smiling, encouraging, smiling, hugging, helping, joking, cheering, smiling, oh, sorry, working, praising, laughing, loving, and last but not least, there you go, there you go. We need to start doing that. It makes a big difference. How many of you would rather be in a room with someone who's smiling than someone who's not? I tell you what, you want to try something fun? I've done this several times. It's a little scary, but try it. Get on the elevator. And when everybody's packed in the elevator, turn your back against the door and just smile. First, they think you're going to rob them. But after a while, everybody on the elevator will be smiling. And, and then listen to what they say when they get off. It's so much fun. I've done it several times. Sometimes just for kick. I'm mean, having a bad day. It'll turn your day around just like that. Smiling is contagious. So try it every now and then. All right. Here's point three of the sermon. Hopefully, you'll never forget point two. Your words are seeds. Um. Here, here's point three. Hard hearts and tender hearts are the things that create hard words and tender words. If I have a tender heart, I say tender words. If I have a hard heart, I say hard words. Um, one of the facts that we, have to, that we have to admit, not because we want to admit it, but because the Bible says it, is that the tongue cannot be tamed. It's just one of those things that we try. I mean, all of us in this room, even if you don't talk a lot, you've slipped up and said something you wish you hadn't have said. We've all done it. That's just part of the human experience. So in order to 
get ahead of that somehow. We have to get back to, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. So we have to get back to reconditioning our heart in order to make sure that even if we don't say the right words, the right intent comes out and people know who we are. So I want to read a very tough portion of Scripture in the Bible to swallow. James chapter 3. That's one of those I told you to turn to. So let's look at it. I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole thing. I mean, I could, I could explain every bit of this, but I'm just going to read it. I think you'll get it. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Mm, it's tough, isn't it? For all you teachers out there and pastors. Uh, I said I wasn't going to comment, didn't I? Let's go into verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in the word, he is, per he is a perfect man. And also to bridle and able, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths so they may obey us and turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires for them to go. Verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great forest fire is kindled, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defies the whole, it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by what? By hell. Wow. So hell is looking for a slip of my tongue to start a fire with. So true. For every kind of beast and bird of, of reptile and of creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, the image of God. So we bless God and we curse men with the same voice. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things all not be. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevines bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Okay, so if I cannot tame my tongue and I realize that my tongue can defile my whole body, it can start a fire, it can turn the ship, if my tongue can start a forest fire that, how many of you have seen someone's, an erroneous comment that someone made literally start a whirlwind that was hard to contain? Have you ever seen that happen before? Somebody makes a comment and the next thing you know, it just goes crazy. You can't contain it and they've burned down the whole forest from just striking one match. That's how powerful words can be. But Matthew says, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, listen to this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or, may, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, Jesus is talking to them. How can you be evil and speak good things? Jesus says, make up your mind. Either decide to be good or decide to be bad. Because you're ruining yourself and your testimony and everything you say by straddling the fence saying bad things and good things at the same time. You're confusing everybody. He said, either decide to be a good tree or a bad tree. He says, a good man is known out of the good treasure of his heart, and it brings forth good things. And an evil man is known out of the evil treasures of his heart, and it brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word, well, this is tough. Every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. Okay, let's just stop for a moment. Let that one sink in. I don't like that, but I didn't write that. I will give an account for every idle word. You will give an account for every idle word. 
For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I missed a great part of verse 34, so let me recap that for you. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, I want you to stay with me for a moment, because I want to talk to you about something that really, I think the Holy Spirit really wants me to hit home hard today. Um, If I cannot control my tongue, what can I control my heart? I have to get forgiveness out. I have to get offenses out. I have to get all those things that cause me to think bad and feel bad and say negative things. I have to get those things out of me so that when I do speak, even impulsively, that what comes out is from a pure motive and a good and a good place in my heart. Um, I, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter four for a moment because this verse of scripture talks about what happens to a person who doesn't bridle their tongue and they end up grieving the Holy Spirit. So I want you to go there with me. I'm gonna read, start in verse 25 of Ephesians chapter four, verse 25. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Verse 28. Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something something to give. Notice that it's not about stealing, it's about giving. That he may have something to give to him who's in need. And then number verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is, what is uh, good for necessary edification. Now get this, that verse is telling me, it's not good enough for me to stop saying the wrong things. It's only good enough if I start saying the right things. I can't just quit criticizing you. I have to start complimenting you. I can't just quit saying the wrong things. I have to start saying the right things to speak life into you. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, I want you to see these four things that grieve the Holy Spirit. What does it feel like to grieve the Holy Spirit? Have you ever felt like God was distant? You ever felt like you can pray, but nothing's happening? That's an indication that the Holy Spirit's grieved by something. Doesn't mean that God will, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It does not mean that he doesn't love you. It does not, it just means he's not happy about something. I know that's how it works with me. That when I feel that distance, no matter how much I pray, I can beg, pray, 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 praise, 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 praise. I still hit the ceiling. I still hit the wall. Anybody ever felt that before? You still hit it. It's like you're on spiritual autopilot and you're just trusting that all the good things you have done is still keeping you in good grace and you are still in good grace, but you're not hearing. You're not getting the answers. It's like he's distanced himself. He does that so that we will seek and find him. It's God's favorite game, hide and seek. He does that so we will go looking for him. But here's what I've found out about that. I have to do this all the time. I wish I could tell you this has only happened a couple times to me. Uh Uh-uh. It happens over and over and over. I will realize that I've said something. I've I've talked about another minister before because I just didn't agree with their their tactics. And the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute, I called him. Did you call him? You didn't call him. I called him. What's that to you? I've done that before and grieved the Holy Spirit, and he has distanced himself from me, and no matter how much I pray and beg and study and quote scriptures over myself, I can't get fellowship back until I ask forgiveness. Not from that person, but with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I talk to the Holy Spirit the same way I talk to you, and I'll say, Holy Spirit, I grieved you. I I know I did. It was this, wasn't it? That's what I I shouldn't have said. I am so sorry that I said that about that person. I'm so sorry that I did this. I know you love me. I know I'm saved. I know the grace of God is on my life, but you have distanced yourself from me because of something, because I did one of these four things that grieves you. Now, what are those four things? First of all, lying. The Bible says God hates, being quoted in the scripture, God hates lying hates it. Not only that, it says that of the six things that God hates, he he says in two places of the six things God hates and the seventh one that he hates the worst, two of those are about lying to divide the brethren, creating dissension and division. 
He says that God hates that more than more. I don't care if you can quote the Bible from one end to the other. If you divide brothers in faith, God hates it. And if you sell things that are half-truths and untruths and, and things that you just know a little bit about and not, don't have all the details, that grieves the Holy Spirit. And he will, he will remove himself from our presence when he is grieved from that. The other thing that grieves the Holy Spirit is unresolved anger. When you hold on to your offenses, instead of doing what Matthew 18 tells us to do and go to the people that have offended us and get it out, get it on the table, we have to get it out of our system, talk to them. If they won't listen to you, take somebody with you. If they won't listen to you, get some people in the church, go back with them. We, if we hold on to those offenses, guess what that passage said? You're giving place to the devil. Unresolved anger in your life, whether it happened yesterday or 25 years ago, unresolved anger in your life will cause the Holy Spirit to be grieved in you. Because everything you do and everything, every message it gives you has to be filtered through that unresolved anger. Go tell this person I love them. Well, God loves you, unless God wants you to tell somebody they love you and you have a bias against that type of person. If you have a bias against that type of sin, how I many you know there's people in this room right now that God cannot use to reach some sinners because they have such a hard bias against certain types of sin? So God just can't use that person. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. Now notice this. Any unresolved anger inside of our life grieves the Holy Spirit. Then he says, people who do not give, people who have a welfare kingdom mentality, give me, give me, give me. I want everything for free. I want you to give me the sermon, give me the prayer, give me the everything. I don't want to give anything back to God's work. I don't want to give anything back to God's kingdom. I don't want to tithe. I don't want to give an offerings. I just want to take. And the Bible says that that grieves the Holy Spirit. People who take all the time and never give back. That it grieves the Holy Spirit in their life. You know, I, I have, uh, I, I've said this before and recently. I'm an online giver for this reason. I want the very first thing and my finances to go to God. I, I don't want to buy gas before I give it to God. I've learned all that the hard way. I've, I've gone through seasons in my life where my income was a little stretched, and I use my tithe for other things. And I'm admitting that to you. I'm not proud of that. I always paid heavy for it. Always paid heavy for it. Things got out of my control before I knew it. And I realized that I had grieved the Holy Spirit. I would say, Lord, direct me in business. And he'd say, I know the answer, but I'm not, we're, we're not on talking terms right now. I love you. You're going to heaven, but I can't talk to you right now. I cannot give you God's thoughts and God's plans right now because what's in your heart would misuse that. What's in your heart would abuse that. If I give you power and you've got anger, you're going to be a, an angry elf. I mean, an angry preacher. <laughs> Some of you got it. The rest of you, you'll watch elf next year. You'll get it then. If I give you good stuff and it comes out of you the wrong way, you're going to be angry with me. Have you ever met a, a person who's harsh in the altars? That's not God. That's them. That's not God. That's not how he works. That's not the holy, that's not the dove of the spirit lighting on you. That's not God scaring the living daylights out of you. That's not God. That's an issue in them and they're trying to use a spiritual gift through that issue of the heart. Um, then he says, let no corrupt words come out of your mouth. And I want to give you this, and we're going to close. I want you to look at verse 31, and we're coming to a landing here. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Notice he just said in the previous verse, he said, let no corrupt words, verse 29, let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth because this is what grieves the Holy Spirit. Now he's saying, I want you to see this progression. Bitterness, I got hurt. Wrath, I'm seething about it now. I'm not talking about it, but I'm feeling on the inside. That's what wrath means. I'm seething on the inside. Anger, now it's become a full-blown emotion. I can't help myself. You know, I'm feeling it now. I was thinking about it before. I'm feeling it now. That's anger. Anger then turns into clamor. Then we start talking about it. So you see this progression? I got hurt. I didn't get rid of it. I kept it inside of me. It began to seethe inside of me, turned into an emotion, anger. Now I'm talking about it. 
And right now I'm talking about it because it makes me feel better, but then look what happens. That's why he said, do be angry, but sin not. Now my hurt, my anger has turned into evil speaking. It's changed now. I didn't get rid of it. I let it stay there too long, and now it's turned to evil speaking, and the next thing I do is try to hurt somebody with it, malice. That's when I'm now trying to hurt someone. I want someone else to hurt the same way I'm hurting. So now I'm not just speaking evil. I'm trying to get somebody else in pain. I'm doing the devil's dirty work. I have not resolved my issues, so now my issues have turned into something that has grieved the Holy Spirit, and now I'm trying to hurt somebody else. Now, that's the progression of unresolved offenses. Here is the progression of resolved offenses. He says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. He continues on before the Bible is divided into chapters. Therefore, be imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and divided him and, and has given himself for us as an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So look at this. When I resolve anger, my heart changes before my mouth changes. I choose kindness. Every one of us have to choose to be kind. I choose kindness. Now my heart is tender. I forgive. I now walk out grace, and I'm walking in love. I'm going to close with a story. This man lives in Georgia. He told me this story many years ago. Loved his wife very dearly. They had a wonderful, wonderful uh, marriage, great intimacy between them. Everything was great. Went to the doctor one day and she found out that she had breast cancer. It was very radical um, cancer and they had to do a double mastectomy. This woman was so grieved from this experience. This was years ago before they did reconstruction type surgeries in those situations. This lady was so grieved that she shut down as a woman. She felt like she wasn't a woman anymore. She put distance between her and her husband because of this pain that she felt. And their relationship got so strained, it looked like they were gonna get a divorce because she became angry and she could not deal with the fact that she was now not able to do some of the things she used to be able to do in their relationship. And this guy realized he was about to lose his wife, about to lose his family. He had no other recourse, he, no matter what he did, but he chose one method that he believed could heal her. He chose words. Because of a scripture that he read in, in Psalm 107, verse 20, that says, he sent forth his words and healed them. So this man decided to heal his wife with words. He began to speak over her. That's what the Bible says in, in, uh, in, in Ephesians, where a husband loves your wife and wash her with the water of your word. So he decided he's just gonna wash her clean from all of this. He began to speak into her life and leave little notes all over the house and buy her books and have conversations with her. And at first, you know, the walls were up and little by little, he could not touch her. She didn't wanna go anywhere. She didn't wanna go on vacation. But little by little, he began to speak healing words into her life that began to heal this woman's heart as a woman. And finally, he had her back in his arms again. And the story he says, kind of in his punchline of telling the story is that the first time that he held her in his arms and they were going to you know, be man and wife, uh, she said to him, are you sure that I'm not half of a woman now? And this guy, he was kind of a, kind of a rough, you know, kind of a rough, tough guy. He says, oh, come on now. You've always known I was a leg woman. A leg man, excuse me. <laughs> See, words do matter. I've always known I was a leg man. And his phrase was to divert her and say, everything I love about you, I still love about you. You got the point. Hey, I've been making my point all day long today. Good. Every word does count, doesn't it? You need to make a decision today at the beginning of your year. 
create your words first and create your life. You can improve your life if you'll just improve the quality of your words. You can improve your marriage if you improve your words. You can improve your friendships if you improve your words by deciding there's certain things I'm just not going to say anymore. I'm just never going to say it. If I need to heal a relationship between me and another person, I'm just going to send my words to heal them. It may take a while. doesn't mean it's going to happen instantly. But I'm going to keep speaking life. Just keep planting seeds and let those words heal them. I want to pray over you this morning. I want to pray over your heart. And then I'm going to pray for everyone's heart in this room that may not have accepted the Lord in their life. But first of all, let me pray over you. Lord, I know that this is one of those lessons that's easier said than done because we hear it, we know it, we get it, we understand your word. Lord, at some point in time, it's got to get inside of us and transform us and turn us around and change us. I pray, God, that something was said today that we just will not be able to let go of. God, that something the Holy Spirit says today in someone's heart through one of the scriptures that were read or something that was spoken, Lord, that they just cannot let go of it. It just haunts them and haunts them and haunts them until their life changes. I know, Lord, how it feels for me when I've grieved the Holy Spirit. So I pray, Lord, that we will not grieve you. I pray that we'll not grieve the Spirit of God in our life, but we will let those things that are wholesome come out of our mouth, edifying those things that build up and encourage and exhort those around us. Pray, God, that today we will make a choice. Today, some words have to go. I'm going to start using some words, and I'm going to start saying some things more often. I'm going to speak creative words into you. I may not see it now, but if I say it enough, I will create exactly what I see in you, and one day you'll see it too. Lord, I pray today that you'll change your heart that we may change our words. Lord, there may be someone here this morning who's never invited you into their heart. The very first step for them changing their heart is inviting Jesus Christ inside. So I pray, Lord, right now, you would do a work inside of their heart as I pray this prayer with them, the prayer of salvation. Lord, that they would pray this prayer and come into relationship with Jesus Christ, and it would be the beginning of everything they're looking for in their life. So as I pray this prayer right now, I invite everyone in this room to pray it with me, especially those of you who are praying it for the very first time. Let's pray it together. Father in heaven, I admit that I have sinned, but I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Come into my heart, live inside of me, and help me to live for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you just invited Jesus Christ in your heart, would you just lift your hand real quick, up and down real fast. Let me know that you prayed this prayer with me this morning. I see several hands, some in the balcony over here on this side. Praise God for all of these who just prayed with us this morning. Let's invite them or welcome them rather into the family of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want you to stand all over the room and our elders are coming back to pray with you. And if you have any need whatsoever in your life, as we close out our service, if you need to go, we understand that. But if you have any need in your life you'd like to pray about, our altars are open, our elders are here. Come back and let us pray with you this morning. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about Twin Rivers Worship Center or to give, go to trwc.com or call us at 314-729-0704. We'd love to meet you in person at one of our two campuses. Our central campus is located on Tesson Ferry Road, just north of Lindbergh Boulevard. Our St. Peter's campus is located on Willett Road at Jungerman, just south of Mexico Road. Also, check out our audio podcast on iTunes.